welcome to the XY Advisor podcast to join a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Head to xyadvisor.com. Both Zurich and OnePath life insurance offerings deliver the broadest range of offerings in the market with a combined four distinct solutions on offer to better serve all Australians. At Zurich and OnePath, we believe in the value of advice and the professionals who provide it. This means investing in more ways to help your clients and making it easier for you to do business with us. To find out more about how we can help you and your clients, contact your Zurich and OnePath life or Zurich Investments representative today. G'day, g'day, Clayton here from XY Advisor. Uh, During our research into who the best guests were all over the globe for our uh, mental health uh, podcast series is Daniel, who's the author of uh, The Behavioral Investor, as well as a couple other books. Mate, thank you so much for coming on. Yes, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So you've got a really kind of interesting career in terms of you've got such a huge amount of experience, both from the financial planning side of things. Your dad was a financial planner and you work with financial planners through uh, it's Brinkler Capital, right? Is the investment manager. Mm-hmm. Brink, Brinkler Capital. Yeah. 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 And uh, you're also a, a, a clinical psychologist and you've sort of somehow melded these two worlds together, which I'm a massive fan of. Can you talk us about, um, I guess, what are the insights that you would understand? But when you work with financial planners, you find that that's not as clear as it could be. Oh, it's, a, it's a great question. So let me, let me think about what, what I bring as a clinician, I think, is a, a holistic understanding of, of people. You know, I think, I think that one of the things that we've done in behavioral finance is we've gotten good at categorizing what people do poorly right? Like psychology started out the same way. It started out by telling people, uh, you know, this is what makes people sad. This is what makes people depressed. And it's only in recent years that psychology started to study. This is what makes people great. This is what makes people happy. This is what makes them a great leader. So I think most of the work in the psychology of finance or the psychology of investing has been around let's call it irrationalities, like biased and biased decision-making. But I think there's so much that psychology has to say uh, from the way that we gather new clients to the way that we communicate with our clients to the way that we serve as almost a life coach to our clients and and help bring about greater levels of wellness uh, in them. So I, I hope that financial planning as a field will begin to embrace psychology more holistically not just in terms of lists of biases and sort of gotcha for clients when they, when they screw up. Yeah. And, um, and if one of the, one of the co-founders of XY advisor over here in Australia, um, Ray Jaramus, he actually did a psychology degree as his, and he was already a financial planner, right? So he got into financial planning. Um, I came at it from an accounting background and he came at it from a psychology, a psychology background. Um, and, the way that the, and the words that he uses very much reflects that modern style of financial planning, which is that whole uh, life coaching mixed in with the the balance sheet, right? Um, if if we consider for a moment, one of the worst things that can happen in someone's life is to claim on insurance, right? Let's say that they're injured or they're sick to a point that they can't work anymore. A concept that I've been sort of playing around in my mind is. And, and I'd love to hear your opinion on this. Let's say a financial planner does a really good job and they organize the insurances for their clients to a, to a degree that the client in the event of accident or illness never has to work again, right? Is that, to your opinion, having someone, let's say, you know, our age, right? Let's say someone our age uh, can never work again from mental illness, right? So something that isn't, you know, physical. Do you think it's the best idea to have them sitting on the couch watching Netflix all day, uh, claiming on the insurance? Or do you think rehabilitation and getting them back out there and becoming a productive member of society 
is the priority or is it just a case by case scenario or, or do you have an opinion either way? So I, I feel a little bit out of my depth here. I'm, first of all, I'm not sure of, at least in the U S which has a notoriously bad healthcare system. I'm not sure of many mental illnesses that would allow a young person to just claim insurance benefits for the rest of their life. I mean, I can't, I can't think of much uh, that would allow that to happen. So it's a, it's a tricky thing because I think um, when you talk about mental illness, on the one hand, you want people to understand that it's, that it's real, right? You want people to understand that it's real, that it's powerful, that in many cases it's even organic, right? That people are born with, uh, with tendencies or predispositions that uh, make, make life very difficult for them. Uh, but on the other side of thing, if we talk about mental health in an overly deterministic way, and we talk about it in a way where people have no options and that they can't improve their mental health through their decision making, I mean, I sort of reject that, that extreme as well, because I think there's many things, uh, speaking in general, that, that most people can do to improve their mental health. So I think just as guiding principles, we need to be compassionate about mental health. Uh, it is a real thing. Uh, but, but like anything in life, it's biological, it's psychological, it's sociological. And we need to attack that from, from every area. I think there's things that we can do as a culture uh, to improve mental health. I think that Western culture uh, is not very conducive to good mental health. I think a lot of the expectations we have I think our consumer-driven society is, in many respects, uh, not conducive to good mental health. I think that social media is not conducive to good mental health. I think that you know a lot of the social structures that are that are uh, eroding uh, make make good mental health harder and harder. So it's a delicate balance of saying yes, mental health is real. There's organic elements to mental health, uh, but also empowering people. To, to do something about that to, to the extent possible. And so it sort of defies, it sort of defies easy characterization, but I think those are the two poles you're always so, sort of uh, tugging on. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the things I think is probably unique in, in down here is, uh, yeah, we, we've got this thing where occasionally people can get into such a, a stressful state that they can claim on a lifetime of insurance. And it, and it's, and, and I kind of just want to dive into one of the things that you mentioned just there, which was a lot of the Western culture is not, um, is not promoting good mental health. And for me, it's the weirdest thing in the world, right? Because I go, well, the world has from a comfort level has never provided more comforts from a resources uh, level it's never provided more resources and it's almost as if uh and this is sort of a, a layman's view of it but it's also as if as we've removed you know as a society removed um i guess barriers and difficulties and challenges um there's just a certain segment of society that finds the simplicity or i guess the ability to check out, to say it's all too hard. Um, I'm just going to live within the comforts that I can easily obtain. Um, promotes, uh, I guess, this idea that struggle is a bad thing, and then all I should be, uh, I guess, catered to is is comforts and my rights. Um, and it kind of ended up in this weird situation where we've got this huge mental health problem from a clinical psychologist point of view is that accurate in any way or or is am i way off course no so what i what i think you what i think you're talking about is is on target and so i i would cite uh dr martin seligman's perma model so seligman positive psychologist developed a model of holistic wellness and it's got five facets to it um, so the first of these facets, uh, so it's PERMA, that's an acronym. The first of the, the P in PERMA stands for positive experiences. So these would be sort of uh, creature comforts and fun, right? So we want whatever, ice cream, 
trips to the movies, like watch Netflix, you know, all these things are fun. And that's a part of wellness, right? That's not nothing. But when you ask people what makes them well, most people overemphasize fun and ease. And that's just one of the five things that, that makes us, you know, well-rounded and truly happy. I'll talk about the others in a minute, but we've gotten to a point now as a society where that ease and that fun has become so pervasive that it can actually become our undoing. You know, more people die now of, of obesity than, than die of, of scarcity. So we, we're more likely to die of overabundance of, of food and calories than we are from, from underabundance of food and calories. And that distinction was almost unthinkable, you know, 100, 200, 1,000 years ago. So the other four things are engagement, which is hard work, relationships, meaning, uh, and advancement. So, I mean, think about this. Fun is one aspect of it, but like hard work is one aspect of it. And I don't think that many people are saying, I want to go be, be, be truly happy. Let me go work super hard at something. And yet, you know, that's, that's a big piece of it. You think about something like meaning. Um, for much of human history, meaning was sort of in the air. I mean, if you lived in France in the 1500s, or, you know, anywhere, basically, in, in the Western world in the 1500s, meaning was, was being a Christian. And so now, that's not the case, right? And I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm not, I don't much care what, what people's religious preferences are. But at least it was something. You know, people had a sense of meaning in their life. And so as traditional sources of meaning start to erode, again, not saying if that's good or bad, I, I don't much care, but people need meaning. Yeah. You have to replace it with something. You have to replace it with service or charitable work or family or something that's bigger than yourself. So uh, a lot of these things don't look the way people think they look. People don't think that happiness looks like sacrifice or hard work or doing something for a friend. But in fact, the research says you know, happiness and wellness looks a lot different than we think. And it has, uh, it's, it's way more multifaceted than just wealth, than just ease or comfort. I lo- yeah, that's, the, you've <clears throat> uh, nailed better than what I was trying to say. It's absolutely. Perma model sounds awesome, man. I'm going to check that out. Yeah, um, so if, cause, cause you, with your work, you deal with financial planners quite a lot. Um, if you, now again, this is probably slightly out of scope for your role, but I'm interested still in your opinion because I, I do think that you're really well placed. And that is if, a, if an advisor has depressed clients, right? Where, you know, an advisor, as you probably well know, we think the job is over here. And as we get in, we start talking about people and their money and their life. We realize we end up in that life coaching position and <laughs> let, let's face it, completely unprepared. It sort of just gets put onto us from the first meeting. And then you just develop the school sort of on the job over the course of, you know, sometimes decades, right? Um, dealing with depression, I think is one of those things uh, which is an advanced um, mental state, which on the job training isn't really particularly the best, I guess, uh, uh, the best experience to have walking into that conversation. Um, for example, I, I remember reading a, a book once called The Happiness Trap. And it's, to summarize, it was essentially like this, to, the, the tips and tactics that someone uses to to sort of snap themselves out of the majority of problems in life are the exact wrong tactics to use when things are legitimately general, like genuinely bad. Um, And so like the concept of resilience works really well most of the time, unless it's like overwhelming. And then that resilience butts up against the reality of depression. And then you kind of get into a bit of a spiral, I guess. And so um, while it's not insanely common, um, to have depressed clients, uh, but what kind of advice would you give? Even if it's, Hey, go, go learn actually how to deal with this. But what kind of uh, advice would you give to advisors who have depressed clients? 
So I, I would say that it's, it's very common. So the, the lifetime prevalence of uh, major depressive disorder is about one in two. So I think, you know, about, wow. about half of us at some point or another, that's not all the time, uh, but at about half of us uh, so at some time in our lives will have a diagnosable uh, clinical episode of depression, right? So I think it's important for financial advisors to understand what, what is and isn't their role. What, what's not their role is to treat depression, right? Because depression, like you said, um, is when it kind of gets out of bounds. All of us, all of us get sad, right? The, the distinction between sadness and depression is when depression, uh, sadness, uh, sadness becomes depression when it, when it starts to impact uh, the tasks of daily living, when you can't function, right? All of us have mornings where we don't want to get out of bed because we're sad. Depressed folks literally cannot get out of bed. So the, the minute it crosses over from being sort of irksome to actually uh, impacting the way you move through the day, that's sort of a good like working definition of de uh, depression or really any mental illness for that, for that matter is when it starts to impact uh, you know, the, the, the task of daily living. Where an advisor can be useful is they can be a referral source. And it's always a little touchy, right? It's always a little touchy to say, hey, you should, you should go to therapy, right? <laughs> because if it's, you know, if it's, you know we, we kind of throw that around uh, flippantly. You know, when people meet me, I mean, they mean well, they're just joking. But when people meet me and they hear what I do, they go, oh, like, I got, like, you should talk to my wife or, you know, you should talk to my cousin or something. Yeah. Like, that, that's what we're going to do is sort of, you know, dismissively throw people out of shrink. And so I think there's a way for a financial advisor to recognize the symptoms of depression or, or whatever mental illness when, 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 a, a, when a, a period of sadness or whatever is interfering with the task of daily living. I think that financial advisors should be ready uh, to provide a referral or point people in a good direction, kindly, compassionately, 25% um, uh, twenty five percent of visits to primary doctors so medical medical doctors end in a referral to a psychologist so a lot of what people come to general practitioners general practitioners or physicians with you know things like uh, oh i can 't sleep or you know my back aches or I have you know irritable bowels or you know whatever these things that that manifest themselves physically really have a psychological underpinning and that 's why so much of a doctor 's job is to refer folks to a, a psychologist. You know, likewise, financial advisors may have clients that present with problems around overspending or sort of trying to make themselves happy through spending or different things and can need to be prepared to say to their clients gently, like, look, I think this is above my pay grade. I think this is something that uh, you should talk to someone about. And I have, I have some good options for you. So I think, uh, you know, in the U.S. at any given time, about one in five people are taking medication for depression. Wow. I don't know what the numbers look like in, uh, elsewhere in the world, but uh, I think you, you financial advisors have a lot more depressed clients than they probably are aware of. And to the extent that they can be a resource, I think that's a positive thing. Well, yeah, that's a really, really good point. Um, so probably to that end, then it would make sense for an advisor to have not just a, a home loan referral, not just an accountant referral, but also have a psychologist, you know, in the book, so to speak, to refer clients to. I, I think it makes absolute sense. And I think there's a soft way to perhaps introduce that person. If you're doing client events, you know, we'll often do client events with different types of professionals. Why not, uh, why not bring a psychologist in to talk about wellness and productivity and happiness and, you know, get your clients uh, accustomed to meeting with this person, destigmatize that. Um, I think it's a wonderful thing. And, you know, I think, it can, I think it can work both ways because having sat on both sides of that table, just from a strictly commercial standpoint, you know, many times people will come to a therapist with financial problems that the therapist knows 
nothing of, right? I think that can be not that that's why you would do it, right? Not that that's your primary reason for doing it, but I think it could become a mutually beneficial relationship with with each of the professionals handing off clients as as needed. Huh. That's a really good point. I mean, advisors are always looking for who is that, what, what we call uh, a center of influence to have, you know, a, amongst, you know, different, uh, different professions. And that's a really, really good point. I'm interested to see um, your view on probably something that you, you spend a bit more of your day talking about, and that is the current market. Right. So, so working in investments and working in um, psychology and working with advisors, everyone's heard of the, you know, every, every advisor worth a grain of salt knows how to handle the conversation as it's down, buy more, don't stress out. I'd like to maybe talk a little bit more advanced than that. So what are kind of some of the topics of conversations that you help clients sorry, you help advisors have with their clients in moments like this when, you know, we're seeing the early stages of what may be or may not be, uh, but more and more looking likely to be a a serious downturn in the market. Um, How can advisors handle mentally their, I guess, their own role and then the effect that it has on their clients? Yeah, so keeping, keeping with our wellness theme, uh, Dr. Brad Klontz did some work. He's a financial therapist. He did some work a while back, and he found that 93% of financial advisors who were working through the Great Recession uh, of 08, 09, uh, 93% of them showed evidence of anxiety, uh, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder, even in, in some respects. So this is like, you know, some of this stuff is like what people who've gone to war exhibit or people who've experienced a great trauma. So the role of a financial advisor is effectively to be a barrier between their client and a really bad decision. You know, at a time like this, when things are volatile, like you are the last, (laughs) you are the last hope between your client and doing something really stupid. And so to, to be that last hope, you have to be sort of a sponge for their fear, their anxiety. You have to be a little bit of a punching bag for this ill will that they may be feeling. And you have to absorb that. And it's a form of secondary trauma. So I think the first thing that advisors really need to keep in mind is that they have to take care of themselves at a time like this because their clients are looking to them. And more than the specific words, like more than the specific words that that advisor is saying, their demeanor, their look, how well rested they are, like, you know, all of, all of these things convey a subtext about whether or not that client needs to worry. And that client is picking up verbal and nonverbal cues from that advisor. So it's, it's a time to take good care of yourself, to get adequate exercise, good nutrition, good rest, you know, limit, limit alcohol and caffeine, all, all the things that no one's doing right now, right? Like all the things, <laughs> all the things that everyone's ignoring. I've been sleeping terrible for a month, but, <laughs> um, but uh, so that's, you know, sort of job one. Uh, to your second question, I have a three-part system that I developed at Brinker uh, for, for having conversations with, with clients who are in distress. And so it's three Ps. So the first P is purpose. So we recenter that client on their plan. We remind them why they came in in the first place. We remind them that they have a plan, that bad markets were part of that plan, and that maybe we didn't see the specifics of coronavirus coming, but we did see you know, a 20% downturn in the markets coming. This wasn't unplanned for. When we put this whole thing together, it's why we have protection. It's why we diversify, right? So recenter them on their purpose, get them thinking long-term again, because the effect of, of fear and stress is to make us very short-term. Our body marshals all of its resources, right? Everything gets focused very acutely on the here and now so that we can throw a punch or run away, right? Because our body can't differentiate um, between physiological uh, between physical stressors like physical danger and psychological danger Mm -hmm. and so we get very short term and the advisor's first job has to talk about purpose get them thinking long term again okay the second thing we need to do is we need to give them proof 
we need to show them in the history of the markets what happens after times like this, right? When markets drop 20, 25%, what tends to play out over the next one year, two years, five years, right? Give them a sense of the road back and give them a sense that you know what you're talking about. Because at a time of great uncertainty, people want to know that they are in good hands. People want to know that there was someone smart. They want to know that they're with an authority figure. So you need to hit them with some proof next. And then the third thing we say is you need to give them a process. Okay? You need to give them something to do because everybody knows the thing to do right now is nothing. right? Like Everybody knows the thing to do right now is to stay the course. But you're telling somebody with a million dollar account who just lost a quarter of a million dollars because of some virus that they never heard of till last week and it just ate away at a quarter of their hard earned wealth. You're just telling them to chill out. Like it feels very, very flippant, right? Mm. And so we have, we have a propensity to want to act in a time of crisis. So we can try and fight that. We can try and tell people like, hey, chill out, don't act, don't do anything. Or we can roll with it a little bit, right? We can say, I know you want to do something. So let's do something that's not going to blow you up, right? Maybe that's rebalancing. Maybe that's putting in some crash bids. Maybe there's some companies you wanted some, some individual names you wanted to own, but they've been too expensive. So you put in some crash bids and you go, hey, let's hope the market falls another 10%. And you're going to own, you know, XYZ stock, right? Maybe it's giving them a book, right, on how markets work so they can be learning and growing during this time. Maybe it's being charitable and counting your blessings and saying, look, you've got a job through this. And so while things are rough right now, maybe part of what we can do that during this time is support frontline medical professionals or others who are fighting COVID-19. I don't care what it is. Like give them, give them something to do that's not liquidating their account and going to cash. So those are, those are the three steps. Recenter on purpose, give them some proof of how markets work, and then give them a process, give them something to do that'll, that'll keep them headed in a good direction. I mean, good financial planning ensures that there's a couple of you know, years worth of cash, especially if someone's over that age of 55 and the sequencing risk and, and yeah. I, if someone's in a position where they're, uh, you know, close enough to retirement that, that, a, that a 25% downturn in the market is going to have a substantial impact, then I guess first and foremost, you probably haven't done your job as a financial planner. Your goal is to ensure that growth where, where possible and more appropriate when, um, when you're closer to retirement. Um, but I like this. So first and foremost, purpose, then proof, then process. Um, I mean, that's in a nutshell, that is good financial planning. I, I'm a big fan of that. How much of your view of financial planning came from your dad and how much has it come from your experience? Uh, very little of it came from my dad because my, my dad's been in the business for 40 years. So I'm 40 years old. My dad, my dad actually got his job on the day that I was born. So that was, a, that was my dad was mowing yards and he got his job as a financial advisor on the day that I was born. But my dad really grew up, you know, 40 years ago in an entirely different world than, yeah. than we now inhabit. Now, he's, of course, improved his practice and has come around to the ways. But I mean, 40 years ago, you were selling, you know, whatever, like you were selling <laughs> mutual funds with an 8% front load and making... <laughs> Uh, whatever, a hundred dollars every time you trade it. I mean, yeah, it was exactly. very, it's a very, 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 very different world where where people went from you know trying to pick the next hot dot to where we are today of holistic financial planning. So yeah. my dad has been uh, a, a wonderful career counselor and confidant, uh, but you know he's he's kind of had to come around. I think as many people from that generation have, and he has, but he's come around to a more holistic model. It's certainly not what I grew up hearing about, though. I grew up hearing about his thesis on like the next you know stock that was going to shoot shoot through the roof. That's cool though. I mean, I always like, um, 
you know, funnily enough, later today, I'm jumping on a, on a call with, a, with a, 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 an advisor that's 75 years old and he's just done 40 years in the industry. And I said, oh, mate, before you go, we've got to do a podcast and grab some of those, you know, those nuggets that before they, they're lost to the, yeah, to the end right. of time, you know, you've got to preserve this sort of stuff. So uh, that's super interesting. Um, when you were younger, uh, did you have any idea that you'd be working in, in financial markets, in finance at all? Or Because, you know, I'm, I'm chatting with you here. I can see two guitars in the background. So, uh, no. so how did that journey come about? No, I used to be cool. I used to be cool. And, <laughs> I know the feeling, mate. <laughs> then the man, the man got to me. <laughs> exactly. Uh, no. So I went, uh, I did not. So I, I went to school, uh, you know, my freshman year, I went to school to become a psychologist, um, you know, all uh, got my undergraduate in psychology, started my PhD three days after I finished my undergraduate. So like I was 23 when I started my PhD, just started wow. cruising. And I was like, I'm going to be a, a therapist. About three years into a, a five-year PhD program, I started to hate it. It was just, um, it was very stressful you know, meeting with 40 or 50 people who uh, a week, you know, many of whom were suicidal, many of whom who had endured like really terrible stuff. Some of whom were children who were in a horrible spot because of things that adults had done to them. Like just, it was so heavy and I was bringing it home every weekend and I could, you know, it's like my, it was newly, newly married at this point, And my wife's like, Hey, let's go, you know, let's go out and it's the weekend. And I'm like, uh, the world is too bad. You know, the yeah. world is too evil. Um, so I started to look for non clinical applications of psychology. I knew I loved psychology. I knew I loved thinking about human behavior, but I wanted to apply it in a non medical setting. And so, you know, my dad said, look, there's a lot of psychology in what I do. And I initially said, what are you talking about? You know, like you're, you're a numbers guy. Yeah, and I, yeah. think, I think this is a common misconception people have. I mean, I did and I should have known better. You know, people think that good financial planning is all about crunching numbers and it's, it's, it's 20% numbers and 80% psychology. Yeah. And so once I learned that, you know, it's off to the races. Man, that's super interesting. Um, for, for the advisors out there um, who want to reach out, learn more about Brinkley Capital, learn more about what you do, maybe purchase your book. Um, how do they go about finding out more information? Yeah, so um, I write a lot on the Brinker Capital blog. There's a whole behavioral finance section that is a great place. Um, active on LinkedIn, Daniel Crosby, PhD, and uh, active on Twitter at Daniel Crosby. So all, all easy ways to reach me. Awesome, man. Look, thank you so much for dialing in from the other side of the world. I really, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. 